The Coonhound Collective Podcast is brought to you by CZ Welding and Custom Dog Boxes. Dog boxes built by hunters for hunters. Check these guys out today. This is your host, Jason Snurgrove, and I will be your guide as we journey down the road to pleasure hunt or hitting the long trail to those great cop hunts. This is the Coon Hound Collective. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today on the Coon Hound Collective Podcast. Today, I have what has been, after a weekend of autumn oaks, uh, the talk of Facebook for sure, Tony Dominguez, and he uh, was hunting a red bone named G-Man. I'm sure if you've been on Facebook, you've seen him. Uh, Tony, how's it going tonight? Oh, pretty good, Jason. How are you? Man, I can't complain. We just got back from volleyball game girls knocked it out of the park and and shut them out so it, it was it was a good deal and uh i'm i'm excited to have you on here i uh like i said you were you were the talk of facebook and i had kind of been hunting a red bone guy to have on here and whenever uh i, I messaged you and you were game to do it boy I, I i've been excited to get you on here and and let's talk about some some red bone hounds so before we get we- into g-man let's uh let's tell everybody a little bit about yourself kind of where you're from and kind of what you do well um uh, i was actually looking real forward to doing this because i mean i guess all the other guys they they do a lot of the walker guys and and i i really wanted uh the spotlight to be on the red bones not not for me just for the breed you know and um i'm 28 i'll be 29 at the end of the month I run my own concrete business, and uh, that's kind of been my whole family's thing since I was before I was born. And uh, I got into red bones. I think I was ten years old when we got the first one, which uh, it all started like any other person with a red bone. They started watching where the red fern grows, and my grandpa has been a avid duck hunter his whole life, and uh, he's probably more of the reason why I stuck with the red bones because we always uh when we got those they were kind of showbread dogs and they didn't make it and he spent he said we caught heck from everybody I mean that all red bones they're not no good blah 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 so we went on a venture to look for what it was going to take to to beat these guys around the house and he found some older dogs from up in Missouri uh from Spencer Glisson and it kind of just started there, and they just happened to be outlaw dogs. And uh, that's my love for the outlaw dogs has been that way for ever since uh, 2004 when we got them, and uh, we've had a blast with them ever since then. So, in, in your coon hunting, you, you mentioned there starting with red bones. So you started with red bones, and, and you haven't wavered any at all. You've had, always had red bones, or have you hunted any other breeds? No, I. I went through a stage in high school that I felt like I thought I was going to make a living coon hunting. And that was a a huge wake up when I probably five or six years ago, I ran the roads hard and and, uh, I've got some really good friends uh, that do it for a living, Michael Ward and Dustin Weed. And uh, I've learned a lot from them guys, you know, just traveling. We, We all traveled together for a couple years, but, I I want to stay home and and work and uh, start a family and and so I I started off you know with red bone until my grandpa he got he got cancer and passed and uh, the dogs we had kind of passed and so I kind of started hunting for other guys and and running the roads and I was hunting walkers and different different breeds and I ended up uh, I guess. It was right out of high school that that uh, I met Shane, you know Shane Maxey, and he was I could see he was winning with back and picking up with the dogs that were bred up, you know, just like the dogs that I'd hunted, and I thought all that was kind of gone. Well, I started uh, keeping up with him, and I wanted a pup, wanted a pup, and I just he never every time I'd want a pup off a cross he made and. 
it would just uh it was like he never he said oh i got one in mind for you and it'd be a six months eight months later he'd post a uh another uh, ad on pups and i man i want one of those and he oh i got one in mind for you about two years later is when he sent me a pedigree and said, hey, can you come to Cuba, Missouri, Redbone days? I said, I, I'm i pretty busy. I don't know uh, I don't know if I can make it. And he sent me the pedigree on G. And uh, I told him, I said, I think I can make it. You got one for me? And that's, that's where it all started back again. So, yeah, I, I hunted up off-breed, what I call off-breed dogs, but walkers and, and different things. And, and once I got G, I kind of got back into the red bones again. Yeah. Well, before we get to, to G man, and that's, you know, that's, that's how I, I found out about you was, was from G man. But before we get to him, let's talk about some of those years where, um, you know, coming up and w- with you and your grandfather, and then whenever you were on the road, let, let's talk about some of that, some of that stuff and, and some of the stuff that you, that you learned uh to do and some of the stuff you learn that you don't want to do yeah yeah well uh you know my grandpa he was he was always one of those guys that were just you know he always wanted everything done right you know even if you're in a hunt he he didn't want any anything bad to come about from his name you know and so i had a reputation to hold and and i veered off just like any teenager and uh sometimes I wanted to win more than my dog wanted to and it it kind of it kind of set me back for a little while uh I really enjoyed running the road and and when I was you know before I got to getting in with the guys that I did with dogs I I knew what could win locally but I I had no clue what it took to win big like I thought I did um I would go stay with Dustin for a month or two at a time. And in that amount of time, me, him, and Jeff McCord would hunt from dark to daylight for weeks at a time. And, you know, you'd have to take two or three dogs down there just to not be, not wear one slap out. And, uh, that's where my, me as a, I got better. I felt as a handler being around those guys learning, to prepare to win at a at a bigger level you know we uh we hunted really really hard and and you know just watching you know being around them i learned learned what it took to win and what to how to prepare a dog to win you know it's a from what i've seen and been around it's a i don't know it's just it's different than in high school and and pro you know yeah. Even with sports. Well, well, and you know, I interviewed Lane Denny, and that's one thing he was talking about. You know, what you you get ready, you get a kid playing basketball or football or baseball, and they go to these camps, and you know, they spend time out there getting themselves prepared. And it's no different with our hounds. And I just don't think people understand people like Dustin Weed, Michael Ward, and Scott Engel, and yourself, and you know, the amount of hours that is put in, um, you know, out in the woods, getting that dog ready and, and, and getting yourself ready. It's, it's a lot more to it than just going out there hunting a couple of times a week. Oh, for sure. Like, and I've, I've slacked off way a whole lot since then. Uh, used to, I mean, I wore, I've saw, I think I've wore four pickup trucks out since I've had G and, three of them were the first five or six years of his life, you know, and, and, uh, I had guys, luckily I could send him to up North with Shane, uh, or Jesse Bowley. We had him in Michigan, uh, several guys like in Ohio and then Keith Bowling had him in Indiana for a little bit. And then, you know, it's good to have a team to where you can move a dog around through the country. Um, Adam Ringler and, and, Carolina, you know, he kept them for a while, and just to kind of move them around to where they can, they can learn how to treat coons in different terrain, different climates, you know, different areas. 
and that's a major part i think because as a as a purse as a handler we're going to train to win where we live you know these these southern dogs people can say oh man it you know the northern people they talk about how dogs up there operate and the southern guys talk about how you got to go hunt the tree of coon well up north you've got to tree five or six consistently drop after drop after drop or down here a dog gets used to treeing one or two and two hours looks great and you know you i've learned a lot about hunting with these different guys on on what you want in a dog and i feel like if a dog can win in northern michigan and then turn around and haul them to North Carolina, and they can they can go win in the mountains, and then bring them down here to the swamps. It, it's a that dog has a knack for the ability that most don't, you know, because lack of preparation. Yeah, and you're giving you're giving that dog every opportunity to to go out there and perform in all those different conditions, and then that way, whenever you do load them up in the truck and you drive to autumn oats or the winter classic or a pkc hunt somewhere um you know they're they're prepared for for all those different terrains yeah for sure and and it's uh like like with autumn oats you got to have a big score and it, it's about you know getting a good guide but you don't know if you're going to go three hours north and hunt michigan or two hours south and hunt hunt southern indiana you know and and the dog, like for me, it, it's 14 hours from my house to, to Richmond. And it's a whole different ball game from my house to theirs. You know, and it takes a dog that can take that kind of, that uh, loading them up. You know, as young dogs, even like when G was a pup, I hauled him everywhere with me. Even when I was running the walkers, he would be three or four months old in the dog box 10 hours from the house. And if, if they can't take hauling and they can't eat on the road, you're not going to ever be successful with them, period. Yeah, that's and, uh, that's, I, that's for sure. I've seen a lot of dogs, a lot of big winning dogs they, that, you know, that, that would win a big hunt or two, and you put them on the road and really get to running them, and they just fall apart. You know, they, they don't eat, they don't travel. And if you can't eat and they don't travel, they're not going to, you're just wasting your time and entries and money and everything. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, we're, we're going to get into what, what got you to that final cast of autumn oats this year. But, but before we get that far along, let, let's talk about, you, you got G, uh, you said you were, um, what'd you say? 19, 20 years old, somewhere in there. Yeah. He, uh, I think I was around 19 or 20 because he would be, he's nine and a half. So yeah, I was 19 when I got him. Uh, so we went to Cuba and Shane had a whole litter of pups, beautiful pups. Me and my brother went up there and uh, I don't know, it was kind of crazy for two teenagers to drive nine hours. Uh, we had a blowout in the middle of the mountains in Arkansas at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, did had no help. Luckily, a police officer got us to the uh, tire shop the next morning and changed. We get up there, and uh, Shane, we turned them loose, and there was I think there was eight eight pups in the litter. He turned out of his box, and they were beautiful. He said, "You can pick." He said, "You get here, you can pick out any of them." So the first one was a big, beautiful black muzzle pup. And I said, I want that. And he said, well, you can pick them all. But that one, I'm thinking, come on, man. You know, you've wait, made me wait for two years. And so G was over playing by himself probably 30 or 40 yards or, uh, across the field. And I, I told him, I said, man, I want that one. And so he said, yeah, you can have that one. And uh, so we come back home, and I couldn't have been no happier because it was after my grandpa had passed and you couldn't, I don't believe you could make a red bone pedigree look as there's no way possible to make one look as nice as his, as far as, um, you know, he's a four generation, all grand pedigree. And I've hunted 
a lot with a lot of the dogs that uh, he was out of, you know, or, or hunted with dogs off of them. And every dog in his third, you know, there's 30 grand nights behind him. And that every one of them has either one red bone days, uh, Perina races, you know, red bone park, uh, top 100 of the world, uh, autumn oaks. I mean, there's been every dog in his pedigree has won something that was that had prestige to it and i knew that if i got him it was just it was going to be my turn if i put the work in to to make him what he could be you know i know i knew you know if i didn't put the work in it'd probably be just another call in the breed so it it worked out yeah so what what was some of those uh dogs that's in his pedigree well his daddy was a uh, outlaw jesse james jr um which spencer glisten has raised him and uh a friend a couple of buddies of mine josh and travis uh circus they they uh josh hunted him a lot and got him in the top 100 of the world and uh he was off of jesse james which was alton key's dog and uh he later sold to spencer and uh, Right Little Girl 2 was his mama, which Mike Wright's a good friend of mine, and uh, and he used to hunt for my grandpa, and we got really close, and, uh, you know, he 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 done a lot of winning. Well, the outlaw dogs, you know, they, they just, uh, they've been pretty well line bred, Burning Ben and uh, Timber Girl and, and uh, Burning Ben and Jesse, uh, Keys Outlaw Jesse and uh, my partner actually that's on with G Man. Uh, he actually owned the Don Timberjack dog that produced Timber Girl. And uh, actually, you know, uh, Alan, he's been a big part of of what G Man's become and and helping helping me push him and and all of that. And then on G's mama's side. Uh, she's a grand night female named Outlaw Billy Jean, which was also my other partner, Shane, his his Billy the Kid dog. And so we've all, you know, had a part of this bloodline for a very long time, probably back going all the way back to Roger Gibson hunting Famous Famous, which won the Prina race for Roger Shable, you know. And uh, when... Shane made the cross on Billy Jean. He actually got the semen. Spencer had sold it to Roger Shable, and this was the last, the last breeding on uh, Jesse James Juniors that there was. And they bred to Billy Jean to get G Man. So it was kind of a, it was kind of a. If it don't work, there won't be no more. Yeah. So, okay, you you made a run to Missouri. You you got G Man as a puppy. You get him back to Texas. You you you've hauled him kind of up and down the road with you as you're you're handling these other dogs. Let's 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 talk about four or five six months old, and and you're getting ready to get him started there, and and, and kind of get him going. What 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 was he doing? How was he operating? That type of thing. Hey guys, this is Jason over at the Coonhound Collective Podcast. Is your dog box starting to get war? Maybe it's starting to get a little crack like mine is. Maybe you've just been thinking about it's time to upgrade to a to a new box, but you've asked your buddies and you're just not real sure what direction to go in. Well, let me help you out here. Go check my friends out at CZ Welding and Fabrication Custom Dog Boxes and Aluminum Products on Facebook. You can check out all their custom work they do there and their designs that they do. If you don't see something that you don't exactly like there, reach out to Nathan at 540-810-5439, 540-810-5439, or send him a message through the Facebook page. I bet he can fix you up. Don't wait till fall to get that new dog box. Go ahead, get that dog box now. Get you uh, get you something looking good in the back of your truck that, that you can be proud of and that you can haul your dog around in comfort. Check my friends out at CZ Welding and Fabrication. You won't go wrong. Dog boxes built by hunters for hunters. Get yours today. CZ Welding and Fabrication. Well, he was he was always super smart. I mean, he he had the seemed like he had the brain of a of a human sometimes, you know. And it's 
it's weird to say that, but the dog doesn't need a leash. I mean, I, I can tell him to go get my truck and he'll go find my truck and get into it. You know, he's a, he's later, he's kind of lazy in the day. He's been that way since he was a pup. He, he loved the water and, and I, I made a mistake with him as a pup that actually caused a lot of ongoing problems throughout his life. Uh, I put him in a coon pen and I, that when I got him out of the coon pen, uh, he, he would swim the ocean to cover a dog and he would tree with him and didn't have any clue what he was treeing on. Uh, you could shoot a coon out and he wouldn't pay it no attention. Like he had no clue about it. And so I just started hunting him with my older female, a walker female I was hunting, uh, named Blindside. And one night out, we were hunting him out of the boat and, uh, and he treated coon ahead of her. Um, not one that we saw. It was just a wild coon. And, uh, I drove the boat around and, and ran in there and tied him up and, once I shot that coon out, it was like a light switch went off. And, uh, you know, I started just singling him out. And he would strike tracks and just drive them in there. And when he'd locate, he'd quit and come back to me like he didn't know how to tree. So I I would take him and walk him back in there and get him treeing and knock him out and not let him have him. And then, and then uh, he got to where he was sticking trees out. I started knocking them out. I, I would knock, and that's probably where I went overboard with it. I I would shoot five or six a night, and uh, I fed him a lot of coons, and and he started a few problems of shutting up. You know when uh when you'd get close, and I mean there there was small things that I had to work out with him, but it was just being an excited teenager about a, a eight or nine month old pup treeing coons like that. You know. And uh, I, I guarantee at one time I fed the buzzards real good at Lake of the Pines. Well, yeah. I, you know, I think as, as young people, we've all been been guilty of that. I know I know I've had some young dogs back in the past where I, I probably fed too many coons to them and, uh, you know, probably got them, got them grabbing trees a little, little too much. But, uh, you know, that's, that's part of it. That's how you learn, especially if you, if you don't have a mentor, you know, right there with you, helping you every step of the way and you kind of having to figure some stuff out on your own. That's just part of it. Yeah. I, and another thing is I was bullheaded too. I couldn't, I couldn't be told one thing or, or another, you know, I, I felt like that was doing him good. So I was doing it and I learned, you know, just from, the trial and error, you know, I, I'll always tell everybody he, he was my trial and error dog. Um, I love the hunt. You know, at that time I, I was, you know, 20, 21 years old and I, I felt like I had to be at a hunt every weekend and through the week too. And that's not how you make a young dog, you know, and I, luckily I wasn't hunting him, but I was, I didn't really, like I said, I didn't really know what it took to win at a big level at that time i i was coon hunting and running these hunts for other guys and and um but finally you know i just i i started learning from my mistakes with him and he was kind of a practice dummy okay so at, you you're you're still running the hunts for other guys and stuff at what point do you you make the decision of okay i'm not gonna hunt dog for somebody else i'm going to focus on g-man i'm going to put him in in these hunts and i'm on i'm gonna run my own dog did, did you have him at a certain point that you felt confident that you could compete with him at that level or was there other circumstances that that led to that well well he went uh i put him in a few hunts here and there and uh i actually got in some trouble with ukc and it was just from being a kid, you know, and, uh, I took, I had to take some time off. And when I got reinstated, he, uh, first time I put him in, I went to Oklahoma. I was actually working on a pipeline up there and, uh, I put a first on him and I come back home and tried to put a, tried to hunt him in some hunts and I just couldn't get it done. And I was getting frustrated and, and Shane told me, 
Tony, just let me bring him up here, put some, put a kill season on him, and I'll, I'll try to get his last two wins. And that way, when you, uh, you get him back, you can try to work on granting him. You know, he'll be a little bit older and mature. Well, I said, okay. So I sent him up there, and Shane had coon hunted him. And uh, I guess it was probably two months or three, something like that. And, and uh, he was just getting him ready for kill season just to have something young to mess with. Well, he he wanted to put him – he told me, he said, look, I want to put him in a hunt just to see what – what he needs work on and he went he went two hunts you know just boom boom when he finished i guess being young and naive i wanted him back and shane shane said tony don't don't i'm scared you're gonna run him if you go to put him in these hunts and so i got it he you know no i want him back i want him back so i pushed it and uh got him back and uh we we did some coon hunting after that and uh and he took off and started winning winning more, you know. But where I got frustrated at hunting other people's dogs is is uh just being on the road, you know, you think you're making good money and these guys are some some guys don't wanna pay good or, you know, you do a good job for one and and uh, I've hunted for some good people and I've hunted for bad, you know. Everybody has if they've done it long enough, but you you get to hunt and you make a dog you really like and and then they turn around and sell it for you know buy it for nothing and sell it for a lot and then you're stuck with no dog and having to make another one and uh, after I'm not champion G or Shane not champion G I brought him home and went to coon hunt him and man he he was really he's really coming on strong and at that time. I, you know, I, I didn't have the finances to hunt my own dog. I, I mean, I could locally, but, you know, I, I grew up poor my whole life, and I'll probably die poor. You know, and I, you know, I got some good offers on him, and uh, my mom told me, you know, she said, Tony, if you sell this dog, that money's going to be gone, that dog's going to be gone, and you're just going to, you know, you're going to be starting over. You probably won't ever get one like him again. And uh, so I took her word, and I, I turned down a, a very, very huge offer by two different guys. Um, and I was telling Shane, I said, man, I, I don't know what to do. I, I got a good young dog, as I feel like any in the country, and, uh, and I don't have the finances. You know, I don't know what to do. And he found, uh, you know, Alan, I had not even talk to Alan at all. I didn't even know who Alan was besides he owned uh, Don Timberjack, which was a huge winning dog in the, I guess, the late 80s, early 90s. And I, I've i always been a fan of the dog. My grandpa was, too. And uh, he hooked me up with him. And so Shane somehow gets Alan talked in that this guy that's living in California that's a golfer and a veterinarian tossed in to partner with me on this dog. So we get in a group chat, and before it's over, Shane and him both has done bought half the dog, and we're three-way partners on him. And at this point, they're going to make it possible where we can go run and do whatever we want to if the dog's ready. And uh, that's kind of how that partnership started. And it's it's uh, it's changed a few times. Me and Alan, we've bumped heads, and I mean, I look at him more like an older brother now than a partner. And uh, don't get me wrong, we've had, we've sure enough butted heads, but we he feels like now that he can trust me, and and uh, he knows what I know what's best for our dogs. And there's not a dog that's in our kennel that we're not partnered on. Yeah, and you know, just the everyday person, you know, they like you and me, you know, we we just we don't have the money to run up and down the road and and chase some of these big hunts. But man, how important and how valuable is it to have partners like that to to be able to help you out and you know be able to to partner with you on, on these different dogs and G man and, and and help you be able to run up and down the road and, and get him get his name out there and get you know be able to run him in some of these hunts yeah well the, the main thing 
and I've sat down with Alan and talked before too. I, I see so many of these guys that they they try so hard to make a living out of out of this, and they want a backer, want, want this guy to back them and buy their dog and this and that. And I told Alan before I run a friendship with him. We'll, we'll sell the dog or, or whatever. I'll give him his money back or he can give me my money back. I'll ship him to California. But an I, 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 animal is not worth a, a true friendship, you know. And uh, he has been, man, he has been my, my right-hand partner and and will always be. I don't care if there, there's been dogs that he didn't want no part of that I bought and he would laugh about it, and his he would still be my partner on it, you know. And he'll he'll tell me, Dominguez, what are you doing this for? And then, you know, he we we've been in some situations, some good and bad situations with that, you know. But it's always he he's never uh, he might bitch and complain from time to time about something, but he's always uh, kind of let me have the reins on whatever we needed, and I I can't. I can't thank him enough as a partner and a friend, you know, um, for what he's done. You know, my mom passed away, uh, I guess it would be seven or eight years ago. And, and Alan, he come up with a lot of money for funeral expenses, you know, that I didn't have. And, uh, he's just been, you know, he's been a one to me from, from day one, you know, he's, he's been a good, good partner. And, uh, I could never, I could never replace him as a partner. I wouldn't even try to, you know. And uh, Shane, he's the same way. There's never been nothing that I've ever needed that he had that I couldn't get, and vice versa, you know. And it, it's a, uh, it's crazy how how one dog can bring bring guys in like that as friends to partners, and. Uh, and still be, you know, going strong now as, as a dog that's nine years old, you know. Yeah, for for sure, and that's uh, that that's pretty awesome. It's good to have people like that in your corner for sure. Um. So okay, where uh, you you you've got G Man, you you've got your partners, and and you're running up and down the road. What 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 was your you, you, you're working on grinding him out. So, what what other goals was you working on there with him? Well, you know, it started out. I wanted to get him granted before he was two, and uh, I had four wins towards grand on him, and I won. I think it was six or seven out of maybe ten night champion casts that I put him in to try to get his last one, and I I couldn't get it done. I mean, I I, I was running all over the place. I'd win with three, like, one, I double, had double cast wins at the Texas State Hunt that would have finished him, and I would come in with, like, 362 and a half one night, I think it was Friday night, somebody, uh, a friend of mine, actually, Joe Manning, he'd come in with three, like, 63 and a third, and it knocked me out. I was like, man, I'm never going to get it done. Well, uh, a week before he turned two, my mom passed away. And uh, I got, we had a hunt here in Sulphur Springs, and a friend of mine, Preston Bowles, which him and his son are super, super good to me. Um, Preston said, "Hey, I'll I'll take him to that hunt," and uh, he ended up finishing that night. And I wish I could have been behind him, but it meant a lot to me for uh, for my friends to come come through when I needed them to, to get it done. And he, he didn't finish it two years. He finished it two years in one week. Um, it was a crazy thing, but you know, I couldn't have been more happy for the dog. Yeah. And again, that's just, that just shows the support that, um, you know, people look at coon hunters and think, yeah, that's just a bunch of rednecks out there doing stuff at, at, at dark and, who knows what they're out there doing, but, you know, just, just in this, this story and, and hundreds of other stories that I've heard of how, you know, in, in a time of need, coon hunters come together to, to help their friends out. And, and maybe sometimes not even their friends, maybe they just come together because it's another coon hunter. It's just, just like a brotherhood. Yep. 
it, you know, my fiance, she, she's uh, she's uh, the number one. When we first started dating, she had no clue what a, a coon dog or a rooster was. She was a uh, poor thing. You know, I, I tried uh I tried taking her coon hunting. She had one night of that. She said, you can have it, and I know you're not doing nothing behind my back. Because I would come in late at night, and she'd think I was out running around. <laughs> and uh, after I took her one night, I, I ever think about coon hunting now. She, now I can get her to go to the hunts with me and ride. But as far as putting on boots and a light, she said, that, that's not for me. And uh, she's actually the one that takes care of all the dogs now. She's a, she'll wash the kennels two or three times a day. Get every every month they're on the there's some parrot of trio. She she's got it written down. She's got everything written down on what's done to the dogs every month. I mean, if it wasn't for her, I, I don't know that I could even do what I've done. You know, and uh, that's when I kind of went to where where i am now so i slowed down on the hunting a lot but i uh you know i want to get more into the breeding the breeding side instead of the running uh running all the hunt i feel like g is has made his mark and uh i've actually you know i've studied him since he was a two-year-old and uh he had a lot of health problems in the last year which was a crazy cause and uh so i kind of wanted to slow down and start back over hunting some young dogs off of them and and get more into breeding because uh shane he's he's getting ready to retire and he's kind of not he's kind of wanting to slow down on the breeding and i, I don't want to ever lose this line of dogs they've been good to me you know on and off since 2004 and uh i feel like it's my time to step up uh, and do you know make the make the crosses to carry on the line? And when I told Alan that, he just kind of shook his head and told me I was crazy that he wanted to stick with winning winning coon hunts. I said, well, we can do that, but I wanna I wanna buy Shane. You know, Shane sold me hit the last three female grand night females he had, which I bred two of them the G, and they are they are throwing super nice pups and. I just didn't, when Shane kind of ran it across to me, he said, look, I, I don't want to uh, sell these females to anybody, but I, I just, it's time for me to kind of slow down until I retire. And it, and I'm wore out from, from making, you know, raising pups the last, you know, eight or 10 years. And uh, so now I, I've done, I feel like that I, I went and got the best, females that i could possibly buy in in our kennel right now i mean there's some good ones out there in the red bone breed but and uh you know i've always said if if g was a female if if g would have been a female i would have never had a g man it'd have been a g girl or something else because um i'm a female guy like hunting females and uh when you got a good female you can go breed to whatever you want you know, anything you want, you don't have to sit here and, and beg and, and kiss guys, you know, rears to, to breed to their females. And if you're going to have a stud dog, you just better bite the bullet and do it because uh, that's what it takes to breed them sometimes, you know. Yeah. A couple of things there that you touched on about your fiance taking care of, uh, or she may be your wife now, um, taking care of, of, of the dogs and washing the kennels and taking care of a man. That's, that's so important to, to have somebody around that, that you can do that. I know just here a couple of weeks ago, I had to go to back to Alabama. That's where I'm from. Originally I live in Missouri now and had to be gone for a week. And man, I've got, two young kids here at the house. I say young one's fixing to be 17 next this coming weekend and one's 14, but you know, they just, they just stepped right in. They made sure the dogs was fed, the chickens was fed and stuff was took care of here at home. It went when, even though I wasn't on the road coon hunting, I was on the road taking care of other business and they, uh, it, it's just so important to have, have somebody like that around that can, that can step in. And I know, I, I know sounds like you're very appreciative of that. And I know I am for sure. And, 
I know there's a lot of guys out there that, that are, you know, very appreciative to have those people around to help them, help them take care of those dogs. And, and you touched on, um, G man being sick. So, so uh, bring us, bring us from, from where we were at up to him being sick and kind of go into, to what was going on there. Looking for a hound that is producing winning puppies? One that is throwing proven winners? Then look no further than Grand Knight Champion. Champion. Silver Champion Stylish Bushwhacker. His pups have earned $450,000 in PKC and $80,000 in Pro Sport. He is a PKC Super Stake and UKC Performance Sire and number three on UKC Current Reproducer List. He is throwing hard going, hard treeing, get in there, get it done tree dogs. If interested in breeding to Bushwhacker, contact Justin Davenport on Facebook or at 954-614-8138. Bushwhacker is located in Fredericksburg in chilled or live breeding. Well, like... I'm thinking it was last year at Automotes it is when it started, or when I noticed it started. Um, I'd actually drew Trent Livingston, the same guy that I drew in the, the top 16 hunting the nice black spot. He was hunting an older black and tan male that year. And uh, you talk about sportsmanship. Those guys that night, they did everything they could to help me. I... I think I'd had two coons tree at that time and uh third tree G struck and he don't bark much on the ground, but he struck for, I think it was a hundred. And I mean, they're driving this track across this cornfield. And about the time he located and shut up and I never heard him again, they boom, boom, boom tree. And, uh, I'm thinking, man, I've got a tree for 25 at least to protect my strike. And so I tree right at the end of tree time. We go in here and he's prolapsed. All, and he's just sitting at the tree prolapsed. Well, these guys are, you know, I, I have no clue what's going on. I'm trying to FaceTime Alan in the middle of the hunt. Uh, we score the tree. They call time. Um, he actually, it gets, it goes back in. And I get over to Alan. I said, man, I don't know what is wrong with this dog, but. I, I don't understand what's going on. He said, if he prolapse, he said, keep hunting him. He said, if he prolapses again, you, you withdraw him and go to Ohio State right now. I said, okay. I said, I don't have a clue what's going on. Well, this was an ongoing thing up until four or five months ago. And it just got worse and worse and worse. So we took him to, to several specialists, uh, I took him to Dr. O'Hanlon, which I feel like he's probably the the sharpest artificial insemination vet in the country. Um, he told me it was enlarged prostate. Uh, a couple of vets, or local vets that I use and trust, they, they couldn't find nothing wrong with him. Blood work after blood work. And uh, so we get to running the, the breed race. I'm $2,200 behind. And I, I make a post joking on Facebook, I'm going to win the breed race. And all these guys go to bet me. And uh, there was like six or eight months left. I think it was six months left in it. And I, I might have had $200 won. And uh, my friend Chris Collins is leading it. I, I feel like he's a good friend of mine. And he, he, he has a really good dog. But he had a baby born at the time. And he took some time off. Well, I jumped on the road and this dog is still prolapsing and I don't have a clue what's wrong. Well, after the race, um, I ended up winning the race by about 700. I, I don't remember exactly what I had. I think I won it by maybe 400 bucks or so by the time it was over. It was a, it was, it was a long, hard race. And I, 
I enjoyed it at the time, but looking back on it, it was it was pretty stupid. You know, I about killed my dog, uh, and I I told myself if he quits on me, I'll quit with him. You know, but I ne- he he never failed when I turned him loose. He was gone. You know, and uh, it got bad twice to where he prolapsed and it wouldn't go back in, and it costing twenty five hundred dollars each surgery to put it back in. And so finally, the last time I scheduled a appointment with Texas A and M, and within ten minutes, boom, they they had what it was. It was a a bacteria from a, a freshwater snail, and I was watching one of the the podcasts, you know, with the wipeout dogs, and that's what had killed Zed, but it killed him like the next day. And I don't understand how it happened, but uh. You know, when we got to Texas A&M, Lauren, she was she was talking about putting him down and how, oh, he's just, you know, it, it, it's hurting him. And, and so when we go down there, I'm I'm tore up about it, but I, I'm not, I don't want no nobody seeing me cry, you know. And uh, tech, when they told us that, he had a big tumor in his intestines from this bacteria that was eating his intestines away. And uh, I get to look in the veterinarian woman. She's running around trying to find Kleenex. I'm, think, I'm thinking something's wrong with the dog. And Lauren is sitting there just, she's fixing to squall her eyes out. And so I told her, I said, we get this fixed. I said, I don't ever want to hear you talk about putting this dog down again. And uh, needless to say, we spent an arm and a leg. And, and uh, it, it, it ended up being... 6,500 there. So we, we spent over 12,000 saving and, and getting them better. And that goes back to the partnership deal. Alan, you know, I wanted to retire him and send him to California. And Alan told me, nope, we've all had to bury a dog. It's your turn. When he passes, he's going to be at your house. And so he was behind me. He, he, if it wasn't for him, the dog wouldn't probably be alive because I couldn't financially myself afford to, to to dump that kind of money on a dog, period. You know, and he was he was behind me a hundred percent on saving him and I'm I'm glad he did because I mean that the dog's like my best friend. I mean he he listens to me like a human and, and now he you know, he come out of that surgery uh, four months ago, and I, I've got the best in-laws that I could possibly ever have. They, uh, they kept him at their house, give him medicine, and uh, I said, well, he's ready, you know, start back hunting him if you want to. And I go over there. I'm so busy with work, I don't get to go over there every day. But I go over there, and they have him, they have him probably 30 pounds overweight. And he just looks at me like, man, you're here to get me. <laughs> and so I pick him up, and he did not want to go with me. He, that, that's his retirement home. I mean, he, he's treated like their own kid over there. And uh, I kind of had to cut his feed way, way down and start exercising just to kind of even get him in shape. But up until Autumn Oaks, I don't think he had been hunted, but like, maybe four or five times I've carried him to a hunt or two just to have, just to get him out, you know. And uh, I feel like this was the least I had ever prepared for a hunt. And if it wasn't for me getting those females from Shane, I probably wouldn't have even went with him at least, you know. And uh, But that's kind of where we was at with his health. And uh, luckily, you know, he's still here alive. We got it fixed, and, and he's back acting like a two-year-old pup again unless i hunt him pretty hard yeah well and we're we're fixing to dive into to autumn oaks and leading up to that final cast but uh what before we hit record here you were telling me in some of the other kennel clubs what all g-man had, had won money wise and, and and stuff like that go, go through that real quick and then we'll we'll jump into to autumn oaks well um I had really good luck with him in CHKC before they closed down. Um, I want to say he won between fifteen and twenty thousand in that kennel club. Um, he was the first Redbone to ever win an elite shootout, 
um, which I think it paid forty eight hundred that that night. And uh, he's he done a lot of winning. He won the breed race a couple times. Uh, won the breed hunt. Got moved to the uh, to the quarterfinals of the world hunt a couple times. Um, then moving in the PKC, I really didn't do much with him uh, when he was really really young. I got his money one for the super stakes, and the first year I hunted him in it was his two year old year, and he he had a horrible birthday. He, he he's like uh like maybe ten days away from being a spring a really good spring birthday, if that tells you how honest Shane is because I know a lot of people that probably would have held the birth dates back and just sent him off as a spring you know pup and he'd have had a great birthday. So I was hunting if I was hunting him in the two year old division, it's more like hunting him against three year olds. You know, that was a huge disadvantage, but uh. In his two-year-old year, I could not buy a cast win. I don't believe he treats for anything under 100 all week long, and I could not win a cast. Um, leading into his three-year-old year, I'd made him a PKC champion just hunting around here. And, you know, like I'd go to Little Dixie and stuff like that. And uh, I ended up getting him. That year was probably the greatest year that uh, that we had had with him. We had we just won national grand night champion at autumn oaks um he looked really good that weekend the red ball part i went to little dixie drew some drew a world champion uh had good luck up there won, won my cast missed out on a couple final fours um then we went to the super state the first night i doubled up and uh I ended up getting in the final four that, that year and got second reserve. And then uh following month I went back for the world hunt and got him in at the world hunt, the PKC world hunt. So he won uh by the time he was three, I think I had a little over eleven eleven five one with him. And uh we kinda took some years off. Uh I got burnt slap out because I was running the Cali female that Allen had bought from Brian Layton, and uh, man, we had a really, really good, good year with her. We won, we uh, we actually blew the state race and the breed race completely out of sight. Uh, won won a pro hunt, uh, won a bunch of stuff with her. I think we had eighteen thousand won with her, and here here G is in the prime of his life, and I'm some I'm I'm burnt out. You know, I have. We have ran all over the country with her, and uh, so I needed some time off. I I sent him, you know, out and uh, to Shane and and Jesse, and then Adam got him, and just we kind of moved him around just to get him, you know, just do some more coon hunting with him. And uh, Keith Bowling, he got him and kept him for a little while after uh, Shane had had him up there, just kind of letting him relax. And Keith said, man, Cody's getting old. I want something to hunt. Well, Cody come in heat, and she's one of the – her and, and the Brianna female saying on, in my opinion, they were – they have been the best reproducing females the breed has has probably ever seen since Moonlight Kate. And, uh, you know, which most of our dogs go back to Kate. Well, well Keith started hunting him. And he had some problems, I guess, just being rusty, you know. And Keith, Keith hunted him really hard and got him, you know, through, through the, I guess he was four or so, five. And, and Keith really, really got to doing some hard hunting on him. And and he's a lot of the reason he's finished out the way he did, you know, because that that dog in the prime of his life, that, that was perfect. He, he wasn't running the road. He wasn't. Uh, getting wore out from the miles being on the road at that time he was getting tune hunted you know and uh when i got him back we went we went right on the road you know i i finished in the platinum champion um got him in at a few big pro classics got him in at the lone star pro classic at uh, lone star 5000 uh we hunted it off and uh a friend of mine i had to be at uh somewhere that Saturday morning 
And so Ryan Croson took him that night now and said, man, what are you doing? Why, why, you know, we, we spent this amount of money on entry. So I said, dude, if this guy can't win with him, no, I sure the heck can't win with him. And, uh, he ended up getting second that night. And, uh, I picked him back up and we went to Oklahoma. I got him in uh, up there at Quapaw, which that's to me the best tune hunt in the world. He operates up there. And uh, we kind of just went on a went on a good run. And, uh, you know, then leading up to the breed race in PKC, uh, I felt like I did something I, I probably would never be able to do again. I, you know, coming from a $2,200 lead to leading the breed race and, and winning it. It was just, it was a wake up for a lot of guys that doubted him, you know, and uh, I'm not one to brag. I mean, if a, if a dog's good enough, uh, an owner shouldn't have to brag. They'll, they'll brag on their self in these hunts, you know, it, and, you know, I've heard it from a lot of people that say, you know, cream always rises to the top and and uh, he's always been my go-to. If I if I ever felt like I could win anything uh, with a red bone, it would be him. It seemed like don't matter what position I put him in, he's always going to try to find a way to, to please me, you know. And we've always been on the same page. Yeah. Well, it, you you definitely, definitely done some winning there with him. And, uh, you know, it's – you just you you pull up at a hunt and there ain't, there's nothing wrong with walker dogs I, I had one here not long ago here at the house and there, there's a lot of them out there and there's a lot of them winning it's just it's something about when you see a, a different color dog than than a walker dog winning that you know really makes you you, you, you kind of your ears perk up and and, and kind of take a second look at it and i'm sure that's what was going on with with you and g-man during that time for sure well you know I, I've never been guilty of it, but I know a lot of red bone guys want to compare when they go to these hunts. They, oh, well, there's a hundred walkers to one red bone. No, when you're in a cast, there's one red bone against whoever you draw. I'm not going to let another red bone beat me just because he's in my cast. If, if I'm there to hunt, I'm, I'm there to win. And I'm there to hunt and beat whoever I draw. I don't care if it's Alan, Shane. I mean, some of the best, hardest hunts I've ever had to compete in, my partner Shane's there with another dog in a final cast trying to beat me that with a dog that he co-owns, you know. And, and that's the kind of competition that I like hunting against. I don't want to say, well, there was 100, 100 walker dogs there and and – I'm the only red bone because that's not the way I look at it. I look at it as I'm going to that hunt to win that hunt with a red bone. I mean, you got a good walker. You got something everybody's got. You got a good red bone, a plot, blue tick. You know, well, the blue tick breed's coming up, has been coming up. But you got a good off-color dog. You got something nobody has. I mean, and it takes a lot. It takes a lot more either hard-headedness and stubbornness to to win with an all three dog or a lot more dedication. And normally it's kind of both. So there's nothing I love hearing more than, man, I got I got my butt beat by this red bone. I mean, because normally I'm the one around here leading, you know? Yeah, and, you know, you're, you're right. It does take dedication and, and maybe some hard-headedness. But I tell you what, Tyler Duncan interviewed Jason Miller, I think was his name, on Coon Hunting University. And, he laid a scenario out that, that happened with him, and I think that's the reason why the Walker breeds where it's at. Uh, him and Barry Kitty just about come to blows to, to hear him tell the story on the podcast. And even though they were that mad with each other, his dog come in heat and he was re- ready to, to, go, to go breed to Barry's or vice versa, ever how it went. I don't remember exactly how the story went. And I, I, I've I've noticed in some of the other breeds that, you know, people are quick to say, well, you know, that one time that guy made me mad. And so I'm not going to deal with him anymore. And, and I th- not, maybe not in every, every aspect of it, but in a lot of aspects of it, I think that's hurt some of the other breeds and not being open-minded to say, 
you know, yeah, that guy, I might not like him, but boy, he's, he's, he's packing a hound and, and I need some of that in my kennel. Well, the thing with the red bone guys is that that is a major, major problem and issue. And I've had guys ask me, well, why don't you outcross? Well, for one, me and the guys that's hunted this line of dogs, the outlaw dogs, the moonlight dogs, timber, timber chopper, the old original timber chopper, um, we work with each other. And, and my outlook on things is, is if, if a dog can't beat mine consistently, why go breed to it? You know, but when I had a, when G was an actual stud dog and being promoted as a stud dog, you would be surprised at the rumors. And, and th- this dog, if you looked at him, you would think, man, he's the most laid back dog, best friend you could ever have. I mean, you could, when we, when I was younger, me and we'd, we'd start a bonfire in the backyard. And when I was over at his house, and he would go turn G loose just so we he would lay around and by the fire and while we while we just talked, you know, and and different things and and the dog has has had so much hatred throughout his life from the time he was a pup till till you know here I would say in the last two years if you loved him or hated him he's he's if you hated him he's gained your respect you know you can't. You can't knock what he's done as a dog and his heart. I mean, it, I've put him in some situations that that if anybody else put most dogs in, they'd probably quit and, and not ever be worth a dang. And uh, the red bone breed, the biggest problem is jealousy. You can beat somebody night in and night out anywhere in the country, and they're not going to hardly ever give your dog credit. And, and 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 it's sad. And now that I have all these females, you'd be surprised how many guys that that started and and have down this this dog that's never done a thing wrong to nobody. How many of them want to be your friends? You know, when you got something they want to breed to, it, they're gonna be your buddy. And I don't mind out crossing. I. I I am a line, I love line breeding because the outlaw dogs and the timberjack dogs, they have, they have produced over and over and over with us line breeding. Uh, but, you know, I, I've got a grand night female off of G here and the red bone breed's lacking a lot. And then it's going to take more than me and a few others to change it. We're going to have to get on board together or we'll see, we'll keep being the laughing stock at every major event there is. And uh, she come in heat, and I, I took her and bred her to the to Clint Burger's pistol dog. He's a platinum champion, and uh, I've been hunting with a lot of pups off of him, and I was pleased with quite a few of them, you know. And I thought, you know, if if I'm gonna make an outcross, this one should work. I mean, he he comes from three or four generations that I've hunted with and I really like, but I've never got to breed to them. And uh, I've hunted with every dog in her, you know, three or four generations that I like. I said, it it should mix, but you never know. And that's the thing with outcross. They're either going to be really good or really bad. And uh, I feel like if the red bone breed open their eyes and work together, the, the breed's not, not completely gone but you know 10 years ago me and paul gingrich alan gingrich's brother were talking about it at autumn oaks this weekend 10 years ago each each uh bloodline or kennel had three or four stud dogs to choose from now you know in 10 years of hatred and and drama and uh blindness it's uh you know, you don't have but a handful of stud dogs, period, and that that's worth breeding to, in my opinion. And I, I'm just not going to breed to to whatever because one dog out of you know three or four generations turned out, and it won a it won a big hunt. I I breed to what a dog's reproducing, 
because you're not going to breed to that dog and get that dog. You're going to breed to what he's told. And and then I look back several generations on what the ancestors behind that dog done and how they operated, and if that's what I want to add to mine. Because when you go to line breeding and breeding them tight, you're going to get the good and the bad traits out of what you're breeding. But if you can handle the good traits more than the bad, you can call through and and uh, and get what you want, in my opinion, you know. But, yeah, the, the red bone breed, in my opinion, has, has went downhill. Uh, a lot of the good hard hunters had has quit. Um, but I feel like it's coming back because there's a newer generation that, that has the, the – the will to win and prepare to win and i feel like in the next several years there's going to be some really really nice young dogs and and, and heart and people that really coon hunt and do the breed right i feel like that that we're going to come up probably and and win as much as ever you know but we got to work together because if you don't as a breed uh that's that's where we've lost that you know you know a good walker man they can hate each other's guts and, they, and they'll drive they'll drive 15 hours to breed the stud dog or a red bone man you can they can hate the man their next door neighbor's guts with a good red bone and drive 15 hours to breed to a colt you know yeah i am I think you said it there best, and that that that's the thing. You know, I don't care if you're hunting a red bone or English or black and tan or a plot or a blue tick or a leopard. You you uh, you, you got to work together. You, the the breed has to each breed has to come together and work together to make it better. Uh, you know, within itself, and that's that's what the Walker guys done, and the proof's in the pudding. I mean, you you can tell it's it's the breed that's out there. So. But uh, all right, let's uh, you 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 load G in the truck and you're headed 14 hours to Autumn Oaks. Uh, tell us what happened. Hey guys, this is Jason at the Coonhound Collective Podcast. I jumped in here real quick to tell you about a raffle that we have going on. We have joined up with our partner CZ Welding and Custom Dog Boxes to raffle off a 24 by 20 by 38 single door top storage dog box. Nathan built a really great quality product. You can go over to the Coonhound Collective Facebook page and see pictures of this dog box. There's also ways that you can pay to get in on this raffle. There's 53 spots at $25 a spot. Now, some of those spots have already been taken up, so don't waste time. Get over there and get your spot reserved. Now, all this money that we're raising for this dog box is going to Superior Kennel Club. That's who the monies are going through. It's Superior Kennel Club, and it's going for their Youth World hunt they're having in December in Alabama. This money is going to allow Superior Kennel Club to pay more spots first and second place. So go over right now, get you a spot reserve, help promote the future of our sport, the youth. Go over and get your spot today. Thank you. Well, I had plans on pulling a, a trailer up, and uh, Lisa and Shane had raised the litter out of a female we bought named Banshee and Chad Cartwright, Chaos Dog. And uh, I felt it was going to be a good cross. Uh, a friend of mine, actually, in uh, Tennessee owns a dog, a pup, and he has been making some noise. He, he's eight months old. He, he made dual champion before he was eight months old. And he's actually off of my addiction female. Um, when Shane when Shane told me that the me and Alan, these three females, that the three that come was Moonlight Addiction, Moonlight uh, Overdose, and Moonlight Banshee. They're all out of Brianna, which was the, the top reproducing female that I was telling you about. Um, well, Shane had bred the chaos, chaos to... Uh, Addie, which is who I call her, and this pup come about, and man, I got to watching this pup. And I'm thinking there's no way that this pup's doing this, and so he he he's super super nice. And so Lisa, I guess they had bred Banshee to Chaos, which is a three quarter cross to to the broke pup, 
And I told Lauren, I said, if I buy these three females, Shane and Lisa are going to, she had 10 pups. I said, Shane and Lisa are going to have to at least throw five of them in. I said, because I'm going to get them into the best, best hands I can get them into. I don't care what I have to do. He said, well, if you really want to get a litter of pups, I said, yeah, let's do it. So we, as this is going on, um, I've been trying to buy that book on Hattie female from uh, Wayne O'Mary for, I guess, I guess six or eight months because she was one of the ones in the breed race that made it so interesting. Because when I took off, she took off, and man, they won. They won a ton with her. You know, she won PKC Redbone days, uh, got in a couple pro classics, and she's not everybody's style of dog, but. It, she's a winner. I mean, there's no doubt about it. You you can haul her anywhere, and, and she is the one that's going to make you shake your head, and then normally she's going to beat you. So in the mix of all this, getting ready for all the moats, Wayne messaged me and said, hey, I'll, I'll sell you Hattie. And so it caught me off guard because I just bought these three from Shane, and it about caused me to be single. She was mad as a hornet when I bought her because I never told her about it and and that was probably my fault but anyway so we leave to go Will Baron goes out on my trailer that I'm going to keep all the pups in because I don't like keeping them on the ground well we get to Alabama pick Hattie up Wayne his uh I guess it's his grand boy had a bad pull in the wreck and was in a hospital so I didn't get to meet him I just I swung by picked her up and we got to Autumn Oaks on, uh, I think it was Thursday at about 3 o'clock in the morning. We were absolutely give out. We we had been on the road more than 14 hours, you know, and it was, it's hard. You know, we, we drove, we took turns driving, and it seemed like we was never going to get there. So we got there and got situated. And, uh, what makes it easy on G is, is I haul him in the back seat. Now, I lift my seats up, and we we make him a bed. Normally, he'll go to sleep and not wake up till either we get out to take him for a walk or we get to the hotel, and then he, he'll he wake up in time to get, get back in the room and go back to sleep. And that's just it, – it's, it's rolling through the motions with him nowadays, you know. Yeah, for sure. So you, you – uh... You, you get him up there and on on Thursday morning and don't don't sound like to me you had a, a whole lot of time for for any sleep there for for yourself to to be ready. So how, how does uh how, how do you how does Thursday did you hunt Thursday night? I did. I hunted in the duels. Um, it's always been a uh, I guess it I guess you could say it was a, it's a traditional thing to hunt him in the duels because. They give me heck about him. You know, you got to win your cast before you can show. Well, normally I've got a couple of couple of friends of mine. They always want to. They always want him to show in the duel. So I said, you know, I'll, I'll hunt him in it. And yeah, I, I was running on about no sleep because somehow I got tricked into driving ninety nine percent of the the way. And. Uh, so we get situated and rested up. I hunt in the duels just to kind of let him get his legs stretched. I wanted to go to Labor Day Classic, but, man, after the long drive, I, I said, I'm going to just stay around here and either hunt the duels or go, you know, let him stretch his legs or something, just kind of get him out. Because at this point, he hadn't been hunted like four or five times maybe between his, from the, when he had his surgery to now and he had just been a couch potato and so i took him and hunted him in the duels and and he looked really good um i drew out with jeff young from michigan and dj williams from michigan and we all we hunt together quite a bit i i've never hunted with jeff but um we've been around each other a lot at the hunts and it it was more or less like a buddy hunt we we enjoyed ourselves not not one argument um heck we found each other's coons and uh i mean it was just a really good hunt and and g g ended up scoring 600 and uh we ended up walking the last i think it was 35 minutes out of a 90 minute cast 
and he had made a circle tree to itself uh, before that. So it was a pretty action-packed cast, and I didn't really want to wear him out, so it kind of worked out good, you know. And uh, he did. He got beat in the bench show um, by a younger dog, which, you know, I guess he's showing his age, and he's kind of breaking down in his joints and stuff. So I took him back to the room, and I didn't touch him. I, I left him uh, – I left him alone and uh, come draw out. We drew out of Bryant, Indiana, and uh, Preston Street was, was guiding us to Rich. Well, Rich Henry was guiding us, but I drew out with Preston, and he was, he was down as a guide. So we, uh, man, they have got, I, I've always had good hunts at Bryant. And, uh, I mean, coon population, if you're going to draw out of Indy, if you're going to draw out of Autumn Oaks, Bryant and Convoy is probably the two best places you can you can draw. Convoy is a longer drive, and that's where you know Seth and them's from, and they have they have a lot of coon there. But somehow Bryant, I've drew there a couple times, and I I just get put in really good hunting. And uh, luckily, I had Rich Emery guiding you know Preston, so we we got to go to some really good hunting and. Uh, we had a, I guess in the first 45 minutes, I was, I had two coons treed. It was a real action-packed cast. I had two two black dogs in the cast and, and Preston. And uh, Preston withdrew, I guess, about an hour into it. And so we tree a third coon and, get, and, and we go to, to move. And we had some problems, which luckily I've kind of been there before. And so I, I kind of saved myself from getting, you know, too out of hand and, and trying to do everything to go about the procedures on the right way. And uh, I videoed, you know, kind of what was right and, and, and the act. And I que- my, we, had a, we had a question arrive, and I, I questioned it. Hunt's over. I tree another coon right at the end. The other black dog backs me. And at this point, I'm either going to lose the cast by 25 or I'm going to win the cast by with 725. And the closest thing to them was going to be 450. Um, out of the six drops we made, he had six first trees. So, you know, in the, the first, uh, the second coon, he was by himself on the third. The rest of them, they were kind of all together. But, uh, he had pretty much led the cast the whole night, you know. And so we get in to the uh, Master of Hounds, and we present, I presented the question, and I, I got overruled. I lost, I lost the question, and so I appealed it because I felt in my heart that what was going to be done right was going to be done right. And if I, didn't, if I didn't appeal it, I had no chance of it, you know. And uh, – I'd had enough, you know, knowledge of the rules that it saved me. And I've done kind of been in situations like that before to know how to handle a situation when it goes wrong. And so I appealed it and it was, I was kind of, I'm not going to lie. I didn't let, I didn't want nobody knowing it, but I I was an emotional wreck because this dog, I, I, this is one hunt that I'll never miss till the day I die unless something on some some kind of circumstances come up. Even when I'm not hunting, I could always pull him out and go to that hunt. And Autumn Oaks is if you've never been, it's it's the absolute my favorite hunt of any hunt in the world. And uh I've I've told everybody that. And so anyway, in my heart I was an emotional wreck because this is more than likely, this is his last year to compete in this because I've got, you know, young dogs off of him that's doing really good. And, and I want to hunt. If I go to Autumn Oaks, I'm going to hunt a grand night. That's the only way to win it. So I feel like I'm not going to go waste my time hunting a registered dog or night champion. And come, so I appealed the question. The Master Hound, in his heart, he felt like I was right but he couldn't do nothing about it, you know. So I appeal it and we take it to the to the field reps the next day and and 
my phone is blow, completely blowing up, you know, because nobody, there's only 15 dogs in the, in, in the top 16 and the one's pending. Well, I present my question, show them the video evidence I have, and the panel ends up going with me, and, and it gets me in the top 16. And so it was kind of a, a huge relief that there, I still have one more chance, you know, to, to win this hunt. And uh, going into the, the semifinals, hold on, I drew hold, – hold, hold on before you jump in there. I, 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 before we hit record here, you kind of told me the details of what's going on, and, we're, and I don't want to go into all that. But th- what I want people to hear is you see on Facebook that competition coon hunting is crooked, that y- you can't go out and you have a have an honest hunt. But what you did there was basically – you 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 were going to get uh you know a loss handed to you by the buddy system let's say and you followed the rules that were set out by United Kennel Club to the T you questioned it you took it to the master hounds like you're supposed to that didn't go go the way that it should have went you filed for an appeal you went before a panel and then once all the evidence was laid out, it was overturned. And that that's what that's what I want people to hear in this is uh, th- this was something that was important to you. This hunt was important to you. And it could have went a whole different direction had you not known the rules and not know the procedures. And, and may even went a different direction if you probably lost your cool and you know kind of flew off the handle but you you knew enough about the rules and and how to follow procedures to 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 get this you know in the right place to have this overturn to get you to that semi-final cast and and i think it's just important to to just i want to take a minute and kind of lay that out there and um so people can hear because we hear all the time of you know how corrupt and dirty and you know whatever competition coon hunting is and that's the furthest thing that i see from the truth i mean you may not you may not know the rules like somebody else and they may use those rules to 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 their advantage to to help them as a handler out but if you know the rules first and foremost you are going to protect yourself in the long run. It ain't going to always protect you, and there's going to be some buddy-buddy stuff that goes on here and there. But for the most part, if you know the rules and follow the procedures, it's going to protect you. All right, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you don't get me wrong. In any competition, it doesn't matter if it's checkers. There's going to be somebody that does whatever they can to win. And, hey, I've been that somebody. I've been that person before, and to me, it don't mean as much anymore. Yeah, I love winning. Who don't? But when you know the rules, you can prevent a lot of that from happening. And if you get it done to you one time, you'll never forget what a lot of people call it $30 lessons or whatever lessons you're, you know, whatever kennel club you're hunting, that's what they call it. But if you you get it done to you one time, you'll remember the, down the road the next time. And there and there, I will give UKC Allen and and all those guys a huge applaud. Their rules, it's not built for everybody. There's rules that I don't like, but I can promise you, there is not near as many black and white rules in that kennel club as there is any other one. You know, it's it's uh it's pretty cut and dry and it is on the back of that scorecard or in that rules book exactly the way it's supposed to be. And and ninety percent of the people that, that run around screaming that they're getting cheated and they're they're getting this and that done to them, most of it's because they don't sit down and read them rules. You know, you you have just as much time of the day as I do to read them rules. And and yeah, there's some things that that since I've kind of slacked off hunting that I forgot and everything. And it's just like when I peeled that, I laid in that motel room until Lauren was was plumb pissed at me because I wouldn't go to sleep. I read I read front and back of them rules 
until I could. I read them probably 15 times. That way, when I knew when I got in front of those field reps, I knew exactly what numbers I needed to quote, what rules I needed to quote, and everything. And if you don't study them rules, you can't bitch about being getting cheated in the hunt because most of that is is from not knowing the rules, you know. And and I will say this: my semifinals judge and my finals judge, uh, I couldn't ask for no better. There, there were some things that I felt like probably didn't go my way in the finals or something like that. That maybe if I could have done this a certain way or that. But it boils down the better dog won, you know. And, and Cody Carter, he's been around, and he knows, you know, he's a good judge. You're not gonna, you're not gonna pull nothing on him. Those kind of judges like that are, are what what makes it fun. I, I want a strict judge because if he's strict on me, he's gonna be strict on everybody, you know. And, and a good judge is what makes a good hunt. I mean, a lot of people say, hey. These, these, this judge, he, he ain't good. He ain't a good judge. Blah blah blah. Well, if he's strict on you, he's gonna be strict on everybody. And and I cannot complain about how UKC handled their situation and how their the judges that they picked for for the the top sixteen and the final cast. Man, they they were as good a judges as, as as you could ask for. And and if you know the rules you have a lot better hunts than a, m- a bunch of people that don't even try to set and read them. You know, they go, go they go to these hunts, just go into them, and then when you when a rule comes in place that you have to use, you're the bad guy for using it, you know. They're, they're written on the back of that card for a reason. Yeah, and I can't tell you the times that I say, hey, Judge, you mind if I look at the back of that card for a minute? Because I, I maybe I forgot something or whatever, and I can tell you, I've never had a judge say, "No, no, I don't want you to look at the back of the card." They, they're always more than more than willing to turn that card over and let you let you look at something, and and you know, and, and I try to do that if I'm unsure about you know the way something is. So yeah, I just wanted to bring that up to to uh, you know just kind of put some positive stuff out there about competition coon hunting instead of always about cheaters and stuff like that. So go ahead with your, oh. with your semi cast, uh, semi final cast, who you drew and kind of, kind of what, what took place and then your final. I drew, uh, I drew the country club dog of that Terry Tappy and them are on. And, you know, Terry, he, he actually had G at his house for a, a little while, you know, so he, we kind of knew, you know, we knew each other. I'd never hunted with Country Club, but Shane, you know, he told me, he said, "Hey, that dog, I'm telling you, he he's a good one." He said, "You you got you got a good cast." Well, I've been watching, you know, I drew Trent Livingston and a, and another lady, I forgot where she was from, but she had high scores Friday night, I think it was, you know, to get in the Grand Sixteen. Well, I've been watching facebook and we all have if you're a black and tan guy you know i've been watching trent this 14 month old grand night he's got I, you know a lot of people laugh about it but man the, i said that dog's been on a roll you know he finished him last weekend needed three wins i think and, and he won the last three casts and and i've been watching him on facebook I, I told shane i said man nobody knows about this pup i don't guess you know I said, but I've been watching him, and, man, he, he is winning every hunt he's put in him with good scores. I knew I had my hands full. And uh, sure enough, you know, me and me and Country Club, we threw a coon out of the truck together. I had 175. He had 150 on it. And we cut back loose. He got in the beans. Uh, the black pup split, I think, once or twice. The little walker jet it a couple of times and we could but we, we couldn't find coons and uh, we pulled them off of a tree together and we cut them and i had g treed over a, what i call a mountain most call a hill um around 700 well i i asked him you know can we get top of this hill and listen and uh country club was trailing back down to the right and 
we get up the hill and there's some tree that sound like they were right there with him. Well, I strike and tree, they tree behind me and uh, we go in and and, we, and he's got another tune and he had been treed there for for probably 15 or 20 minutes. And uh, when I guess when they cut them, they shot around the hill where, you know, I don't know if they backed them or what. So we plus that one and cut back loose and the black buck trees another coon and a country club he ended up taking a minus which kind of put him out of it because that that second coon gave me 325 and i think the black pup had a hundred off my first coon or something like that so and we were all cutting back for 25 so at this point i just need to keep keep my mouth shut with i think there was 20 minutes left and uh country he if he trees a coon it's going to give him 300 well he took the minus and it put him out the little female was out of it but she took a she took a whack on our tree and uh the black dog he would have had to treat two coons so i just kind of you know kept my mouth shut and just played defense and that's kind of how the hunt finished um we get to the final cast and and uh it's ace of Asa Briggs with a, a super nice English female. Um, Mike Carmack and them, they got in with a, the Dolly female that won it. And I'm, and those guys have always been, uh, they've always had winners, you know. And uh, I knew it wasn't going to be an, e- you know, an easy hunt. You know, Daryl Workman that hunt, hunted her, Man, he's a he's a hard hunter, and uh, the fourth the fourth dog ended up being uh, the history repeats itself or whatever. And uh, Chris is a good dog; he's won a lot. I think he's a gold or platinum in PKC. And I've hunted with him, you know, before. A buddy of mine, he's partnered with him, and uh, the final four was just going to be, you know, it it was going to come down to. So who struck pretty good and who had coons and uh, I believe it was going to come down to who didn't make a mistake. We had a bad storm coming in and uh, right off the bat, uh, the little dolly female, she struck, I struck, he treed, I treed. And I I wanted a big piece of everything, but I didn't want to want to shoot myself, you know. So we tree that coon and man G is just he's wore out. I mean he's hunted four rounds in two nights or you know, or three nights. And so I cut him and normally he shoots out away from me like a rocket. And I cut him and he just walks off in front of us. I'm thinking, man, he he's done, you know. And they didn't give it no time and which, you know, a good judge isn't. He put the fifteen on him right off the bat. And I figured if we just stopped, he would just keep walking, you know, and not stop. That's how give out he was. We ended up going to the little English female, Aces, and he he took off. And and uh, he set out a pocket tree for 50, I think it was like 50 minutes. And uh, I was showing uh, Trevor my garment the whole time. I said, man. It seemed like every time we'd get 500 from him, we'd end up going three or 400 the other way. And uh, Dolly ended up, I guess the English female, she had a coon. Dolly ended up getting treed again and uh, missed the coon, but it, she had a circle tree. And then the English female got treed again. And at this time, Pete is still trailing. I don't, I don't even know where he's at. And so the, we're going to the English female. She takes a, a whack. Uh, I don't know if she, I guess she come off the tree or something. And uh, you could hear Pete tree about 800. And I'm thinking, please tree him because that G is right on the other side of him. You know, he, he said, he said he's 800 and I'm like uh, seven tenths. So I should be close, you know, that direction. And, uh, so we get to Pete, and I can hear G. We're in a bean field. He's on the other side, and it's pouring down rain. And I can hear him, and I cannot get Cody to come hear him because they're they're in the middle of scoring a tree. And I I kind of like 
you know, I wanted to get my advantage in on it like like anybody else would have wanted to. And uh, and Cody did what was right. You know, he stayed down there because at that point they had said, hey, I got the tune, you know. So he, he wasn't going to move from the spot that, that the tune was being showed to him at. And uh, they never did get it to look again. And I could hear G, G you know, between the times they weren't squalling and, and Pete wasn't trimmed, I could hear him. And, you know, most people would throw a fit and get crazy about it, but what can you do? You know, you got a non-hunting judge there for a reason. And uh, so he said, you know, as soon as I get through scoring this tree, I'll step right there if I can hear him, you tree him. Well, I get to looking at the time, and it's uh, seven minutes on the – I guess there was four minutes left in the hunt and five minutes left on the shine time. So at this point, if this dog keeps trending, there's no way I'm going to get him treed in. And sure enough, it, it worked out in that favor. I, I didn't get to get him treed in. And, you know, I could have threw a fit and made a big problem out of it, but all it was going to do was make me look like an idiot, you know. So I, I bit the bullet, and, and I took off after him and got to him and, and handled him. And I didn't even shine the tree. Um, most would have told you all he had a tune, but I, I didn't. I felt we made it that far. And heck, it, that's a good run for uh, for somebody that was unprepared as I was. I, I shouldn't have never made it as far as I did, you know. And uh, so I, luckily, it was a road probably three quarter, uh, probably three tenths from where he was treed. Out to that and it was raining so hard I couldn't get my iPhone to open so I I turned uh, I I was just hoping Shane and them was watching the Garmin and when they come back and uh, I guess the, everybody left and went back to the, the, the hotels or whatever they got to wondering where I was at and figured you know they drove around and got to me um, so we got out about daylight but I was the war out we had a 20-minute ride back to the club. I pulled over and told Shane, I said, man, you're going to have to drive. And when I conked out, I was done. I mean, I, Derek uh, Fox, a good friend of mine, the, the guy that owns bro, the Broke Club that I like so much, he, uh, he actually drove to his hotel and woke me up just to be able to get me up to get to my room. And I, I never thought I'd. I was even gonna make the ceremony. <laughs> we, me and G, we were both. We we couldn't move. And I'm I'm still I'm still trying to recoup from that, you know. But it was a it was a long weekend, and we were sure glad to get home. Yeah, I I can only imagine for sure. And uh, man, what to to only have a dog out that many times four or five times and, and go up there and get him in the finals i mean i know you got to be happy i know you got to be happy with your dog and, and and you know my my hat's off to you as i'm as i you know like i said you you were the talk of facebook um you know you you might not have come out on top but you, you come out on top in a lot of people's eyes this this past weekend and and uh my, my hat's off off to you for sure and uh so you you uh you go to the award ceremony you get loaded up you get back home and uh what what what's the future what what's the future look like i, I know you get you you mentioned a few young dogs there and g's got some age on him and you know it might be time for him to to lay around the couch and air conditioner for a while so so what what's next well I, as soon as we got home the work began. You know, we had, I've got, now I've got Cherry, the Grand Night Cherry female that, that's off of G. She's on two pistol pups is, is what she had lived. I've got uh, the Grand Night Champion Banshee female, Grand Night Champion uh, Overdose and Addie, which are litter mate sisters. And then, you know, we bought uh, the Bookham Hattie female. Well, that, that's five females that's in the kennel now that we're half. As soon as I got home, I, I think Lauren put a death trap on me because she, she did not realize what we were getting into. And uh, she, which now, you know, she, she give them all their, their flea and tick products and 
everything, all their worm and stuff for the month. And she, we clean kennels and uh, just getting back to reality, which is work. And, and uh, but yeah, we, you know, I'm partnered with uh, Mike Rollins on Freak Shot, and uh, he's a he's coming four year old. We're gonna run him in the world this year, and uh, I'm really concentrating on a pup I call the Revenue Man um, that we kept back off of uh, the Moonlight uh, Overdose female. Shane sent her down to get bred, and he's uh, I've really done good with him. I sent him a my father-in-law, he kept the pup. He was a runt, and he about died, and he he saved him. And this pup, I kind of laughed about it. He's like, well, you know, because he don't know nothing about coon hunting, but he he will do anything in the world that I – if I ask him to do anything, he's there for me and, and us, and he will absolutely do – he'll bend over backwards for us. And it's kind of a, you know – I talked about my partners, you know, earlier, and I've got partners at home. Without them, I would I couldn't do anything as well, you know. And uh, Robert is my father-in-law. He he pretty much got the title to uh, start my pups now because oh because of Rev, you know, him and his wife Tiffany. They they uh from the time they're weaned until they're six or seven months old they spend every day with them and and they and robert works from home a lot unless he's on the road traveling and so it works out you know that they'll have them house broke potty trained lead lead trained socialize uh everything you know and they they live on six acres and they'll turn them loose in the mornings and that's that's kind of how about rev come along you know he saved him and and uh, he got to turn him loose in the yard. He sent me videos early in the morning of him treating. I'm like, man, this this pup has has got a ton of talent. You know, four months old, he's treating like a grown dog in the backyard. And I I caught a coon, and it was real hot summer last summer, and he was probably around five and a half months old. So I, I put the coon in the shade in a dump trailer to where he couldn't see it and bark himself out with it being that hot. And they turned him loose in the yard just to let him use the restroom. I said, well, about dark, I'll show him that coon. And that pup, he threw his head in there, and it was just like, boom. He he went 100 yards over that dump trailer and goes to tree and on the side of it. And he had never even seen a coon. And it blew my mind. I said, this is unbelievable. I said, this pup has got a huge future. And I don't want to make the prediction right now because he's got a long ways and a lot, a lot of winning to do before he catches his daddy. But if something don't happen to this pup, he, he'll win twice. He'll be, he should be twice the dog his daddy is. And that, that's a long shot. But in my eyes, as a breeder, I feel like if you don't get better with every generation, you're not you're not breeding dogs that reproduce. You know, we've been hunting this dog, we've been hunting this this line of dogs for a long time, and it seems like every year it gets better and better. Uh, you know, everybody talks about G man, but th- there's a lot of young dogs out of them that's winning. There's a lot of his cousins. Every year, it seems like several young dogs out of crosses that are made with this line of dogs pop up. A lot of these guys in the breed, you know, and there there is some good breeders in the breed, but there's a lot of these guys that in one year, they will produce one or two winning dogs that are, like, phenomenal. And then you don't hear nothing out of that bloodline for five or six years or so, and then they'll produce one or two more. But with this line of dogs, it seems like every year that there is several winning red bones out of the, out of out of them. You know, and they might be in Michigan at Jesse's house or my house in Texas, Shane's house in Indiana. You know, now we got Derek hunting. 
hunting a red bone. Uh, several of these guys has has dedicated their self to to pushing these pups, and that's what, in my opinion, is what's going to move us forward. And I, I'm trying to concentrate on Rev and pushing him, and I've had a lot of help. You know, we, we sent him to a, a friend of mine, Colt Mingram, in uh, Missouri, and he put a lot of hard hunting on him and had him doing really, really good. And he kind of backslid on me, which, you know, I expect that from pups, but I've really concentrated on him, and uh, we finished him the night champion. And there's probably, I'm partnered, I don't even know on how many pups off of G. Um, I know all of my partners, and me and Alan, he tells me all the time, we got too many, but I, if if I place one in somebody's hands and they're not hunting it, I'll, I'll go out of the way to buy it back and give it to somebody that will hunt it. And I've been blessed to, and to be able to put them in good hands that that'll do something with them. And I, I know it costs me money and, and Lauren and Alan both sometimes tell me I'm, I'm ignorant for it, but I feel like this dog has a, more than winning to do and it'll show down the road as a reproducer. Um, it's already actually showing. I, I, there's, there's a pup out of him in Indiana, 14. He's a spring one year old. He's already got his money won. Uh, there's just been a bunch of pups off of him that's fixing to really hit the circuit. And I, I feel like Rev is going to be uh, definitely a replacement. There's also one in Canada that I feel that uh, he's off of Rev's mama's litter mate, the, the Addy female. So it, it comes with this line of dogs that uh, really, really go, you know, and win. And But my future plan will be to push Rev. I've got some young, some other young dogs that I'm partnered on that will be pushed too. But as far as my main dog, it's going to be this Rev pup. And uh, he's just so much like his daddy, but his hunt style's different, and he's got a lot more tools that needs to be put in the box to, to become better than his daddy. But he's got a lot of things that his daddy didn't have at that age too. So that that's pretty much my plans with with Red. You know, and he's going to be. I feel like next year I'll be hunting him at Autumn Oaks. Um, I just finished him the night champion, and he's a fall one-year-old. But I, after the, the red bone breed race last year, it burnt me out again. And I, I took a break, and the pup, if I can get his money one in the next two weeks, I'll take him. But if not, uh, he will be at, he'll be at the, the fall two-year-olds for sure. And, uh, like I said, if nothing happens to them, but you know how that goes. You take a chance every time you cut them loose. That, but uh, I feel like he's got a brighter future as anything that I've ever ever had here at the house. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you definitely got some, some irons in the fire there to, to keep you going. And uh sounds like you got you got your breeding program going on the, on the right direction there and got some bright young – pups coming along there that that's going to do something and give you give you something to to move on forward with with in the future and i know this is hard to believe but it don't seem like it we my timer says we've been going at this for almost an hour and 45 minutes and 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 i i'm as guilty as anybody to get carried away talking about about hounds and, and and the sport that i love but uh do you, uh, you got anything else you wanted to add before we, before we get to the end here? Man, I just appreciate you, uh, wanting to do this podcast because I've watched, uh, I've watched a bunch of them and, and I've learned a lot from, from these podcasts. And I feel like if somebody does these, these other breeds of guys that people can learn you know from them and i i am completely blessed when you message me wanting to do this 
it, it took me a couple of days to kind of think of what I wanted to say. And I hope I said what, you know, what I should. And, and I just kind of let my mind, mind leave me there. And I, I could not thank you enough for, for doing this with me. And, uh, maybe, maybe some of the red bone guys will, will enjoy it. And, uh, and we can move forward as a breed to to produce a world champion or to produce a national champion or, or something along those lines. And I cannot thank uh, my family enough for, for allowing me and helping me to, to become a better person, a, a better houndsman. Um, my grandmother, she would, she's uh, been my number one since I was born. Uh, my uncle and aunt, you know, Mikey and Danny, they, they've helped me with my business, uh, get my business going to where I could be able to afford and enjoy this, this stuff that I do. Um, all of my family, people, my friends that I, I haven't got to mention, um, it, without all these people that I, I couldn't be, I couldn't be near a successful person that I've been without all these people helping me and, and nobody can do this on their own. I don't care who you are, how much money you have, uh, or anything. If you don't have partners and help, even at home, you know, I, I left to go to Indiana Wednesday and I left behind 200 chickens, a whole farm, a business, um, and everything. And if I didn't have these people helping me, I'd have come home to to a lost a bunch of dead chickens, dead dogs, a business that probably lost a you know a lot of profit that I that I didn't need to you know. And I've got guys that that work really hard for me, and and are able to do things for me while I'm gone. And without all the help that I have here, none of this would be possible. Period. Yeah, and I, I think we've said it before. It, it definitely takes a takes a village to, to to make this go around for sure. And uh, I, I know you're appreciative of all those people, and it takes those people to make everything work. Um, That's the. A- but before we before we close it out, do you got a a coon hunting story you could share with us? Oh, I got a. <laughs> I got enough of them to last till we could probably set another three or four hours in here. <laughs> and, uh, so, um, but no, I just, it's just been a, it's been a wild ride, man. I, the, the nine years I've spent with this dog, it's, uh, it's been, it's had its ups and downs. It's been phenomenal. And, uh, I can't, I couldn't, I wouldn't change anything that, that I've done with this dog, if I could go back, I would probably had pushed him harder as a young, you know, four or five year old. But I felt like since I didn't, I got to enjoy him later in life and I can get more out of him now that he's older than what I would have done if I'd have just pushed him till he was, you know, wore slap out at him and in his prime, you know? And so, yeah, we've we, we've had a blast. Yeah, I would I would say so. That's a that's a long time to to, to have one, have it out there pushing him up and down the road and from time to time. And I know y'all y'all have a bond that y'all built together, and I, I know he means a lot to you. And uh, sounds like he's he's been a been a pretty good dog for you for sure. And and it sounds like you got some some good ones coming and. You know, hey, we we may be talking to you again here in the future on, on a different dog that uh, you got in the super stakes or a world hunt or or a national hunt or something. We're we're gonna be paying attention to to those red bone dogs and out of Texas. Yes, sir. And I, like I said, I I, I really appreciate you. Um, and it's not just you know, it's not just one. If I can, if I could win a world hunt with a red bone, I don't care if it's out of my kennel or, or whoever's kennel, I, I would hunt it. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I've enjoyed hunting the off, 
off color dogs, but it, I love I love a challenge and winning with a red bone. I can I can prove to these guys that hunt red bones. You know, go to go to the hunt. You know, go and go and prove these dogs can win. And I like, I've taken a I've taken a lot of guys that couldn't afford hunts and stuff before. And I would pay the entries just so they could hunt the dogs or something, you know, and it ended up turning out to being good friendships uh, and just different things just because I want to see a red bone win. I, my buddy, I've got a buddy in Indiana, um, Mike Rollins. We're actually partnered on the shot dog now. And, and last year, all I heard was how these red bones couldn't win blah 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 and he's and he told me i've got one that can win i said well if you do i'm gonna book you an entry to labor day classic i'm gonna pay for it you keep the money if you win everything and that's how much i want a red bone to win and and what did he do he he took the entry i offered it to everybody in the red bone breed that was on on our red bone forum on facebook he took the entry. I paid the entry. He went and got the dog in the final four, and he made a good lick, you know. And I, I want Red Bones to win that bad. I didn't. I didn't make a dime. Um, it's not about the money for me. If I can open that pro hound and see these Red Bones in there, that makes my day. And and uh, I feel like there is a couple of good Red Bones out there more than a couple that if they just had the chance to go that you would see a lot more of them you know and that's where i want to i want to get the breed that there i want to get the breed as a whole to the national level to be able to compete with these guys that don't think a red bone can can compete because if they if they have to hunt against uh if some of ours we're going to make dang sure they can compete and and push try to push to the top i mean yeah it's sometimes you fail but i mean that's you pick yourself up and and go back to just you know ground zero and start over and until you you're successful and that's i just hope the breed can can get that way again you know well it's definitely uh i think you're you you're headed in the right direction you're you're young and ambitious and I think you uh, got some, a kennel full of good dogs and sound like you got some good partners to help you reach those goals. And I, uh, I look to see some, some red bones in, in some finals and, and, and winning some big hunts uh, fr- from your kennel. Well, as long as I'm alive, that's the plan. <laughs> and, if I, and if it ain't out, I'll make sure it is. He's going to push me until yeah. I get off the couch and go. <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes that's what it takes. Well, we've been at it right at two hours, and man, I cannot. I, I know this is late at night. Matter of fact, it's after midnight, and uh, I cannot thank you enough for for taking the time to to be on the podcast with me today and and share your story and 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 the story about G Man and and your kennels and how you got started. I think it's a, I think it's a good thing. I think what you're doing for the breed's a good thing, and hopefully some some guys will jump on board with you and and push in the same direction. Well, I sure appreciate it, Jason. And uh, if you ever need anything my way, you you're just a phone call away now. So yeah, so, um, I wish you the best of luck with your podcast stuff, and it seems like you're doing great things as well. So. Well, I I really appreciate that, and you uh, coming up I-44 through uh, Missouri. I live just south of Springfield, so don't hesitate to text or call me And if you're up around Branson or Springfield area, and and we'll get together if nothing else, and I'll shake your hand, and we'll drink some coffee or something and maybe turn an old dog loose. Yes, sir. Well, it was nice talking to you, and I sure appreciate it. All right, man. You have have a good night, and we will talk at you later. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh Uh-huh.
Thanks, guys, for listening to the Coonhound Collective Podcast today. We really appreciate you taking your time out of your day to listen to the podcast. If you don't mind, head over to Facebook and give us a like, and head over to Instagram and give us a follow. It's both at The Coonhound Collective. Also, if you would like to reach us here at The Coonhound Collective, you can reach us at thecoonhoundcollective at gmail.com. If there's someone that you would like to hear on the podcast or a product that you would like to hear talked about, please send it to thecoonhoundcollective at gmail.com. Thanks again. Have a great day.